Okay, so welcome to uh, today's session. So um, I decided, you know, in the interest of giving you a more comprehensive view of the material to um, uh, skip one lecture in the module three, okay, because we're going to see some of these uh, dense deployment issues anyway, uh, in, you know, um, with the tool of stochastic geometry. So I'll start the, the last module of the course today, and that will keep us uh, busy until the end of the course. We're going to see mainly two things in this last module. One is stochastic geometry, and now we can apply it to uh, analyze the performance of dense uh, cell deployments. And the other one is complex system science, and again, now we can apply it to study um, modern communication systems uh, like um, uh, Internet of Things, for example, or um, um, cellular networks, and you know the more self-organizing aspects of, of cellular networks. Um, so there are some key issues uh, when we study cellular networks uh, that are always there, no matter, you know, the problem, no matter the system. Okay, so uh, basically we do have uh, some questions when we study cellular networks that are, are there regardless of the system, of the um, specific problem we are, we are tackling. So I would say these are general questions, okay? So um, how do the cells really look like? I mean, I, I'm sure all of you have been uh, like studying and are familiar with uh, this honeycomb kind of, right, um, deployments. Um, some of you might have seen like uh, regular square-like uh, cell deployments. Um, so we did see basically a, f a few of these regular uh, patterns, right? But eventually, how do the cells really look like um, depends on the electromagnetic uh, environment, right? How the signal propagates and the obstacles and you know, also how the um, different scatterers or users or transmitters in general move. So this honeycomb is really good as an approximation, but it's an overly optimistic picture, okay, of, of the cellular deployments. Um, of course, question we're interested in is how many users we can serve, um, uplink and downlink um, situation. Uh, different kind of traffics, okay, so for example, voice, which is a fixed bitrate traffic, or data, which is a, an elastic type of traffic, um, how users arrive or uh, move within the network or depart from the network, and eventually, it's most of what we do boils down to the last bullet, uh, evaluating QoS, quality of service, um, for a typical user, whatever that is, okay, so a certain user which represents all of the users. Uh, for example, um, what is the probability of blocking a call? So uh, there are many things you can do to model, uh, you know, this uh, uh, situation. Of course, a tool that has been used in many different aspects uh, for many different problems is optimization, right? We saw with Professor Da Silva last week, uh, game theory has been applied, especially when you have competing interests and you have sort of more distributed decision-making process. Um, and one that is actually being applied quite a bit at the moment is stochastic geometry in different uh, ways. So what we are going to see in this course is mostly how you model the deployment of um, base stations, okay, uh, or small cell base stations. Uh, some other people are studying the demand, right? So how you actually model the user uh, side of the story, how the users are uh, moving within a network, you know, and the uh, traffic demand and so on. So you can do a few things. Um, so in the first part of this uh, mini, uh, let's say, block of lectures, I'm going to tell you some basics about stochastic geometry with always keeping in mind that we are interested in the application to wireless networks in this, in this context. And then we're going to see some work we did, more specific, you know, uh, in terms of ultra-dense networks and how you can actually 
Fixed model SINR and area spectral efficiency and outage uh, in in a, in a certain deployment. Okay. So it is a theory that has been there for a while. Okay, and uh, even in if you look at the papers uh, applying it to communication networks, there are a few already. Definitely more than a few, quite quite a few. And you, it has been there for the last decade, more or less. Okay, so there are many things. Uh, that have been done. Um, so I in essence, stochastic geometry, it's, uh, it's a branch of applied probability, okay? Uh, it studies uh, random phenomena, either on the plane or in higher dimensions. So I think many of you are familiar with Poisson processes, which actually study, for example, they are used to study the arrival process in a, in a communication system, right? How the users join actually a certain system, right? Uh, um, so it, it is for very present in queuing theory, for example, right? Um, and that is a, a unidimensional process, right? So you study time as a dimension. Now, what we do here, at the very least, we study a two-dimensional process. So you have a plane. Now, there are you know, other works which generalize to higher dimensions, but in this course, we'll focus on a 2D uh, situation, right? Um, yeah, I mean, eventually it has been applied in very different contexts, okay, so like biology, astronomy, material sciences, uh, it's definitely used in image analysis and as we are going to see soon in communication networks, okay. Um, in fact, many tools that are used in image analysis have been also used in communication um, networks, okay, for example, uh, many different transforms, right? Fourier, uh, like Fourier transform or other transforms have been used first in image analysis and then have been many, many things have been actually trans uh, translated into the communication systems uh, language, right? Um, because eventually, I mean, many things are similar when we, uh, and just, uh, I don't talk too much about biology, strong material sciences because I'm not really uh, very knowledgeable on that, but image analysis, to my understanding, has a lot to, let's say, understand, has a lot to do with understanding the situation on a certain plane, right, and how things look like, and eventually what we do when we simulate our network, so we study our networks, we kind of take a snapshot, a photograph of the network, right, of a certain 2D situation, and we want to understand the pattern, so it's not surprising the many tools that have been, you know, first thought uh, or applied to image analysis are now being applied and being very useful in communication networks, right? Because in the main, there is a lot of visual process when we study our networks. We want to see how it looks like, right? B besides the, the math, which is there, of course. So there are some classic uh, stochastic geometry models which have been um, um, taught uh, useful in the, which has been actually applied in the wireless context. And I'm going just to give a short account of that. There is more, okay? Some other models I'm not going to discuss. For example, one is the Cox model, okay, and uh, there are there are a few others. So the basic one, uh, where basically, which we are also going to apply later uh, in this course in uh, in the study of ultra dense networks, is what is called an SPPP, spatial Poisson point process. This is a, this is the generalization of the Poisson process you have seen in your studies to a two D. Uh, spatial uh, situation. Then there is some, some of you might have heard of Voronoi uh, tessellation, some at least, okay? Uh, and then probably these are a bit less known, the Boolean model and shot noise field, at least I think there is less work in the mainstream about that. So an SPPPP, uh, special for some point process, is basically a planner, as we said, for some point process, let's say phi of a certain intensity lambda, okay? Um, now, the, the important facts about this model is that the number of points, okay, which we call uh, uh, phi of B uh, of the process phi in a subset B of the plane is actually a Poisson random variable. So the, the, the Poisson uh, uh, random variable you're, you're familiar with, with the parameter lambda times the, the basically the, um, the Lebesgue measure of the size, so the area, okay, if you're talking about uh, um, a certain 
2D uh, space, it's an area. Now, you have seen the same thing with the um, period in time. Again, you're measuring the Lebesgue measure of an interval, right? It's the same thing. Okay, so and, uh, here we're just measuring an area. In that case, it's a time interval. But geometrically, we are measuring the size of a set. That, that's all there is, right? Um, and uh, so basically, you might recognize this formula, or at least it might ring a bell if you, if you remember something from Poisson processes, because this is the probability of having k uh, points inside the area B, right? So this is uh, E minus the parameter of the Poisson process, and then times the parameter of the Poisson process times the num uh, to, to the power of the number of points you are actually investigating divided by k factorial, OK? So it's a nice expression. Uh, another interesting thing, as we know again from Poisson uh, process, is that um, if you have these joint sets, the number of points in, you know, that you expect to find in the two different sets are independent. OK? Again, we know that uh, from basic Poisson theory. Now, um, we are not going into the, I mean, too deep into the math, because it would require a course, uh, you know, uh, by itself, uh, you you can you can refer to you know uh, to my papers if you're interested in the in the math. I'm just going to give some pointers here of what what we do, the machinery, and then there are also like some books or basic papers I can recommend if you're interested in knowing more about the basics of stochastic geometry. So uh, you need to calculate actually the Laplace transform of the Poisson process, and it has actually this expression. So it boils down to the exponential of, you know, of an integral. It's just the only requirement on H is the real function. So, for example, in our case, if you check our our papers, there is something to do with uh, the power you transmit, okay, and uh, and few other things. Uh, so, this H will actually become something, which uh, is of, uh, in, you know, it, it has an intuitive explanation for the communication engineer. But that's where probably, actually, that's where you would apply the specific knowledge of the field, OK? But you see that, that I'm not mentioning any application here. This is a, a mathematical framework, right? It's general. And then you, you plug in what you, you know, your knowledge of the system, basically. Um, yeah, and if you take the integral of this function, uh, basically you find out, uh, you know, that there is this relation. So you, s you sum over the points, OK, uh, the value that this function as uh, takes on that specific uh, point, OK? Um, now, wha what I recommend, you know, I, I teach uh, sometimes uh, very heavily mathematical classes, OK? So my recommendation to the students is not to try to, to get lost in the details, because we will get lost by definition. So it's more important that you understand the spirit of the thing, OK? The, where you start from, where you end up, some sort of pointers, you know, of the of the proofs or you know of the mathematical explanation because it's not possible without background without studying to understand each single thing okay so it's more important that you get an, a general idea and maybe you start to think how you could apply it you know and then I if you're interested in getting uh, you know um, um, familiar with the thing you will study and you will get there so i don't think there is any you know showstopper if you have some kind of basic knowledge of math you'll get there so don't worry too much about de details. Try to understand the general picture, rather. Okay, it's so the best you can do in a couple of hours, I suppose. Um, so it's a very basic model. So it's not the end of it. Okay, um, it is useful for some things, but it has its own limitation. It's where you start. Okay, and uh, I'm not a stochastic geometer, so I, I used it. You know, it fi it's fine. But there are some people in my group, for example, you saw some results from Professor Da Silva that went beyond this basic model. They're using like models that are better at accounting correlation, for example, between uh, coverage uh, re regions, right? Uh, sp um, a Poisson model is not good for that, OK? Um, so you are using it to represent the repartition of users in different kind of networks, the location of nodes, that's what we do. Hmm? in different networks, uh, sorry, the, the term is what we do, the location of base stations. So either you represent how the users are actually clustered, let's say, um, positioned in the system, or you represent how the access points or other nodes or base stations are actually positioned in the system. Um, 
So the, the good things about the special uh, Poisson point process is that it is simple. Okay, it's not so difficult to grasp as you know. I mean, already from here you see that the math is not you know, uh, sci-fi, right? You can you can understand it's not too complicated, and it allows for a, a lot of um, actually closed form expressions or at least nice expressions which you can integrate numerically. Okay, a lot of it boils down to very nice equations. Okay, so that that's a good thing uh, about uh, about SPPPP. Uh, it's the assumption, though, of having a homo homogeneous, for example, parameter is often too simplistic. Now, you might remember from Poisson uh, random variables that you, you talk about the homogeneous Poisson uh, process when the intensity is constant, right? Lambda doesn't change, so the lambda we saw before. For example, in the case you, you might be used to, uh, the arrival uh, rate, right, of, of users or of packets in a queue it's not dependent on, on time. And this might be okay for some kind of traffic, but it's definitely not okay if the traffic is bursty, right? For internet traffic, for example, that's a bad assumption. That's why people came up with better models, uh, like Pareto, distribution is a better fit, right? Um, same thing with space, right? It's not so realistic to assume that the density of, say, of base stations is always the same. In fact, we know from HetNet, it might not be the case, right? You might have higher concentrations of base stations where you need uh, to provide more throughput, right? Where there's a black spot and then you kind of, you know, intensify the, the deployment. So it's okay for networks that tend to be more or less regular in the distribution of um, base stations in space, but not okay if this assumption cannot be justified. So you see, you start to see that there are, there are limitations which you have to be aware of. Um, so you need models that um, actually take care of other things like clustering and what is called attraction repulsion of points so for example the cox model you know it's it's uh, it's a better model in that sense there are other models like gibbs and so on um, okay and basically so doubly stochastic poisson process means that okay you have the main process which is stochastic and then there is another uh, sub uh, stochastic process which models the, in the intensity. So it's a kind of layered stochastic uh, process, right? So lambda itself, it's a, it's a random variable following uh, Poisson. Mm -hmm. So uh, just to give an idea that it's much more than you know, the SPPPP. Now the Voronoi tessellation, some of you might have even used it or at least seen it, and that's a better uh, model for, uh, you know, um, basically at least better than what we usually do which is this honeycomb uh, or you know maybe we have squares i don't know you know but very regular pattern so a better uh, approximation towards reality is voronoi so voronoi simply means basically given a collection of points on the plane and a certain point x you define a voronoi cell to be the subset of the plane that are closer to x than any other point in phi so basically you have this collection of points and then you define, given any point in the plane, you associate it to the point that is closer to it. Very simple. So, you know, another thing, another uh, hint I give, you know, to people that, uh, you know, um, take theoretical classes, uh, there is a lot of smoke and magic, right? And it looks very, very difficult. But in the main, the concepts are simple, right? It's intuition that guides you. So it's much better if you try to understand the meaning of the thing than the formula. If you understand the meaning, the formula will come. It's machinery, okay? But if you focus, in a sense, on the formula and you miss what it means, you're going to, to be in trouble, okay? So many concepts, if you look at the formalism, oh my God, I'm lost. But in the main, you see, this is very simple, okay? You, you, it's like, um, you know, you get a task to the base station, say, based on the distance. As simple as that, right? Where normally you would expect the highest power. So even from a communication viewpoint, it has a justification. In fact, it's not, you know, no surprise that this is more meaningful as a model than the traditional honeycomb and so on, right? It's, it makes more sense. Okay, so that's all really there is about Voronoi oscillation, I think. So um, uh, it is frequently used to model, uh, you know, uh, location of base stations. I mean, that, that has been there, okay, in few works. Uh, a dual model is actually um, the Delony uh, triangulation. Um, which is actually used uh, as a uh, basically as a connected graph of nearest neighbors, and this is mostly for routine.
purposes. Um, now, the, the con a connected uh, graph simply means that it is a graph where there are no islands, right? No disconnected parts. So no matter how long is the path, from any node, you can reach any other node. That's the definition of connected graph. Uh, the, the extreme case of a connected graph is a full, fully connected graph, which is what we call in communication architecture terminology a uh, full mesh, right? A, a, any node is connected to any other node. A connected graph is a weaker definition. Still, it means that you can reach from any node to any node. Maybe it takes long, right? But you will get there. Um, so what is the plus of the VT, uh, of the Voronoi tessellation model? Well, as we said, it makes sense, right? It takes into account the distance to the nearest base station. That's what we would expect being a reasonable assumption. And if the world was simple and everything was based on path loss, that's, that, that would be the outcome, right? Now, what's the problem? What is the, well, I, I write it here, but you know, um, yeah, I think I would not agree too much with this. Actually, I got this from a scientist working on this. I think to some extent, path loss is there probably here it's meant more the, you know, the, the extent of the path loss, right? So it's like uh, how, how severe is the path loss? I think shadowing is not taken into account, possible interference, fading. I think at least a rudimental version of path loss is, uh, is there, right? So at least it's a step forward compared to SPPP in, in this sense. Hmm? Now, it gets a bit more complicated than math. I'll try to hopefully convey the message. So. We are doing okay with time anyway. So the Boolean model, okay, it's a marked Poisson point process. What does it mean? Um, basically, xi are what we saw before, okay? These are these uh, points belonging to a Poisson point process model. And then you associate uh, something to these points, a mark. can be anything. can be a number, okay? can be any characteristic. Um, and basically, uh, what you do, okay, f uh, you, you practically, um, so the, the, the property, uh, say this mark you associate to the point, it's a radius now, okay? So you will have, uh, you see that again, we are going towards something more realistic. So you do have a point, which say is the base station in our case, and then you have a certain coverage range, okay? Uh, and it makes sense to have a circle because unless otherwise told in the far field, that's what happens to, to, to EM waves, right? They propagate as spheres. If you take the section on a 2D plane, it's a circle, right? Makes sense. Um, so, and then basically you, you consider the, let's say the, the coverage uh, and you, this uh, XOR, it's basically an exclusive sum and it's simply, it's simply there because you don't want to count things twice. So if there is a certain coverage area and then another coverage area, you, you, will, you will have a problem with the intersection, right? Because it, it's kind of if you sum them both, you count it twice. So you take the XOR, as long as there is one, you're fine, right? And that's just that, I mean, nothing else. Um, yeah, so when the uh, intensity is going, so remember that in the main is a Poisson process, so you still talk about intensity and so on. So when the intensity goes to infinity, uh, you are, we have asymptotic results for the probability to completely cover a certain set, okay? So you have, you have a certain probability telling you how likely it is that you will cover all the set, okay? So again, it has intuitive repercussions in the network planning, right? We want to know what is the probability to have um, uh, regions which are not covered by our network, right? That's so you start to see that the models get more and more complicated, but they get also more and more insightful, right? To the operators and, and to communication engineers in general. Mm -hmm. So are we all okay? Yes? Yes. Yes. Whenever the number of planes are odd, we'll have a one, 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 X or one. Um, so you're saying if you have an even number, then uh, right. I, I, there might be conditions on that. Uh, I'm just, you know, I wrote some notes here. I didn't use it myself, okay, so I, I'm just reporting the basics here. Uh, I might have actually picked the wrong uh, terminology because I think in the 
they really talk about the union so possibly but the union is here okay and then let me just check this one okay that's the union I'm okay with that and then the point is the rest um, might be some conditions about avoiding this I suppose uh, I don't have a note about that. Yeah, I think you have a valid point. I, I do believe, you know, th this is simply this simply means avoiding overcounting things. But in the case, you know, it might not be an exact XOR. It's more like, you know, you don't count wise things. Uh, uh, to me, it looks like an XOR is a symbol. But you know, it could be, it could be even if it's uh, some modulo two, then it's the same problem. I think, right? Because one plus one is still zero. So it's, I suppose they might have some condition on avoiding this this problem, right? And you can always define this operator as you want can be you know um, an XOR defined over an odd number of, uh, of overlapping sets right that that would be okay then I think that's not a main a main problem anyway the main reason the main the main idea is that you basically have these Poisson points okay you you, you associate uh, what they call a mark a property which is the radius and then you start to something so you 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 kind of see how you cover a certain space okay that's the main message um, it is actually it starts to be uh, a, s a decent at least model for wireless coverage uh, because of course you can have uh, you can associate these circles as we said to the coverage of a base station and um, the problem still with the boolean model is that the coverage regions are, consi are considered to be independent okay uh, which is not what uh, would happen in fact it's a consequence of what we are saying because normally if I cover a new cover, it sums, right, the power. But that's not what happens with the Boolean model, right? It's a consequence of that. Um, it, has, it has been used, I mean, to, to uh, study uh, ad hoc and mesh networks connectivity. Um, there, are some, there is something to do with phase transition. We're going to see a bit of that also in the complex systems um, uh, part of the course. And the, the the, the transition is from a phase where you have a disconnected network to a phase where you have a connected one, okay? And disconnected and connected here, we have to think in terms of overlaps, right? So um, you might want a continuum of communication, right, for your network. Uh, what is, why do you need that? Uh, well, if you are serving your customers, your customers should expect a continuity in the service, right? So it, it doesn't make sense that I'm served here and then there is nothing and I'm served there. That's not what you want, right? So it, it, it is important to identify how much, in a sense, you need to deploy so that you, you go from a situation where you have this, this continuity uh, regions to a, to a situation where you don't have those, right? Makes sense. Um, yeah, phase transition is more general than this. Uh, I mean, of course, you are, you are familiar with the phase transition of water, ice, and vapor, right, and, and so on. Um, and it is there. It is something we also see in, uh, um, for example, when we apply statistical mechanics to networks. So there, there are uh, uh, phases where the network is uh, heavily interfered and phases where it is not heavily interfered and you want uh, transit uh, from the phase where there is too much interference to the phase where there is not too much interference, right? So there are, there are useful actually applications of, uh, you know, this, um, phase transition uh, studies to, to communication networks. If time allows, I might tell you a bit um, in, about this in the end, but I have to see how it goes with the, with the course. Okay? We, we did some work about this uh, uh, phase transition in, uh, in wireless networks. So um, the good thing about this, again, it's in a sense a child of the Poisson model, so whatever was true there, like it's simple and uh, nice uh, lead to nice expressions, closed form expressions, it's, it's there. Uh, it also can account for attenuation effect, right, because of this coverage region. So beyond the coverage region, the signal is not there anymore. So there is a simple way at least to uh, calculate that. It does ignore interference effect. As we said before, because the coverage regions are independent, so if I am basically, if a certain uh, coverage region from another point 
hits my coverage region, normally I, I should see in the intersection an effect, right? Because the, the interference should go up. But you don't see this with the Boolean model. Hmm? Any question? Comment? Yes. So Uh, homogeneous and uniform. Okay. Yes. Yeah, I mean, you know, the yeah, I I think the question, you know, I don't know if this was audible till till you know the end of the room, but the question is which one do you pick, right? Because there we start already, we saw three, there, there there's going to be a few more. Um, I think it depends on the problem, okay, and the level of realism you want to embed. So a model per se is not right or wrong. A model is a representation of reality, and you know, it's, it's useful to the extent it solves problems or it gives a better understanding of the system. So you should always favor, first of all, a, a, a model that, you know, solves problems you have, okay, and then, Normally, if you add, like, let's say you start to add, you know, um, layers, uh, either you model new things or you model better things you're already modeling, the, the math normally gets more complicated. So the more you add uh, to your model, the more, the, 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 the further away you go from tractability, right? That's what also what Professor Da Silva said last week. So that's true, you know, and uh, so at some point you might hit a wall and the model is simply not tractable anymore, and then you're better off with simulation. So, um, you know, there is, uh, you have to give up some of this realism if you want to have uh, closed form expressions normally, okay? So, so there is a trade-off between how accurate you want to be and, um, you know, how, how nice the math I is turning out to be. Um, there are, though, uh, approaches which are, in a sense, in between, like semi-analytical approaches, so we will see actually some some examples later um, where you come up with an expression which has, for example, an integral which you cannot solve. So you don't have a primitive for, for that integral. So you, you will not come up with an expression, but you can, for example, use all you know numerical integration methods uh, to to find actually a good approximation of the area of that integral. So that's good enough, right? And still it leads to a nice expression, right? Just you, the only problem is that you will not have. Um, you will have to live with that integral, right, in, in an unsold form. And that's fine, you know, that's probably the best you can do. Uh, one thing you can also do, it's like you, you, you know, you get a general understanding for a general scenario, which is maybe, you know, good enough for uh, mathematical tractability, but then some specific scenarios might need maybe heavy simulations. So you can go for Monte Carlo simulations for that. So maybe, you know, you get an understanding uh, about what happens if uh, you have some, I don't know, some static beams, okay? But then to have a dynamic thing, it's honestly when you start to add time and so it becomes a nightmare, and then you go into simulations, right? So you see, and at least the, the analysis should guide you towards which simulations you need to run. So the, op the, the approach which is um, oblivious to the, the mathematical tractation is normally dumber because you have to simulate everything. You don't know what you're simulating, right? So you have to, you have to come up with the simulation plan, you try everything. The good thing about these models is that they can tell you, okay, look, this is where maybe, you know, you should look deeper, right? Because you get the general understanding kind of guides you, I think. So the, the simple answer is there is no right model. It depends on the problem. It depends on, on your interest in having mathematical formulations. Uh, now, being a bit uh, pragmatic, if you want to publish journals, you need theoretical tractation. You cannot publish journals just based on simulation. So if, if you are pursuing a PhD or an academic career, it's, it's a factor that you have to consider. Nothing to do with the science itself, but it's, it's one you know, factor that guides your, your CV um, you know, betterment and your career. So you, you cannot give up on this if you want to become a professor, so to speak, okay? Or if you want to become uh, an acknowledged, uh, you know, figure in the scientific community, you need to have some solid mat mathematical, uh, you know, models. Uh, now, it can be stochastic geometry, game theory optimization, pick the one you want, but you cannot give up on that, okay, if you want to become an academic. Um, it, it uh, so, yeah, so there is, depends on the problem, on how good you are at that, uh, you know, on the level of realism and, but 
you, you do need some, I think, okay? some mathematical model. Um, which one will depend on, on many things. Now, the last model we're going to see in this kind of overview of stochastic geometry, uh, models for wireless systems, is called shot noise. So again, it's a mark process, uh, what we just saw. And these uh, SI are some random variables. So the mark now is not discovered, it's another random variable. So again, a mark Poisson, a, mar a mark point process, uh, this is not a solid Poisson actually, um, it's, um, you, you do have a set of points, okay? And you do associate something else, okay? Like before it was the radius, here it's another random variable. Okay, that's the marked point process. Um, and then in this case, you have a, a linear, uh, sorry, a real response function, L. Hmm? Um, and the fun it's a function of the distance uh, on the plane, okay? So it's a function, this L of something, the something is the distance. Um, so you basically sum over the points, okay, SI, which are these random variables, the function of the distance, Y minus the point. So uh, if you want, I mean, to just to picture things better, normally this variable means where you are on the plane. And the X size are, this set of points are, in our context, the, where the base stations are. Okay, so when you say, L of Y minus XI, it's a function, whatever it is, of the distance where you are, I mean you as a mobile phone say, to the certain base station, okay? That's, that's what it is. Um, so when this uh, phi tilde uh, uh, is, a, you know, say independently marked for some point process, then we call uh, I uh, phi tilde the Poisson shot noise, but the shot noise model is general. So I didn't mention Poisson here. It can become Poisson if we assume basically uh, phi tilde to be, you know, this xi to be a Poisson point process. It doesn't need to be, okay? Um, now, again, nor I mean, w whenever you will see papers about stochastic geometry, you will see a lot of Laplace transform. So it might be not a bad idea if you want to work in this field to refresh your knowledge of Laplace transform because it's, it's, it's the main tool you use, so the, for the Poisson shot noise, um, the Laplace transform of, of this vector, hmm? so any collection of uh, positions you're interested in. So this is not, this n is not necessarily the number of points you have here. It can be anything, right? Uh, they can be different. You can have more users than base stations, less users than base stations, same number, right? It has to be general. Uh, so any set of points on the R2 plane um, basically, uh, you can you can calculate. I mean, this quantity, right, for them, and um, basically, the Laplace transform of this vector is is known. Okay, we know this this Laplace transform. I'm not going to give you the expression, but the important thing to know is that we, we can calculate this. Okay, now what what is it good for? Now, some of you might start to recognize some things here, right? It's it looks like things we are familiar with at least. Um, so it is a, a very good model to, to for the total received power in a wireless network because, for example, you could have these marks SI to be the, tr the emitted powers, right? I think, you know, even if I didn't tell you, this should start to look like a model we are familiar with, right? Uh, the response is the attenuation function, for example, path loss, right? common thing we do and you the good thing is that it can also be enriched to account for other aspects like shadowing fading usage of directional antenna so ideally it's probably a very good candidate to model things you know we are we are interested in right um, so what happens is basically this i uh, phi tilde is just a sum of powers so what we normally have at a certain point in space is that we collect all the powers, right, that arrive from different emitters, and usually only one of them, unless you do some coordinate multipoint thing, the only one of them will be useful, right, and the others will be interfering power. So uh, this and uh, you know this is a model where you actually can get close to the situation of a, of a wireless communication system. Hmm? Makes sense. 
you have any questions, let me know. Um, there is actually a, a generalization of, uh, not, not generalization, but another formulation of, uh, of the shot noise model. So here we do the sum. Here is the same, uh, I mean, all I'm saying is the exactly the same, just that here we take the maximum, right? Maximum received power in a sense. Um, again, the no problem. If you have a set of points we are interested in, a set of, say, uh, not, not the Poisson point, but a set of uh, interest points, let's call them like this, on the plane, you can calculate uh, actually the, the joint PDF. So the joint PDF, the joint probability density function of this vector is known. Okay? And in fact, the, the PDF of the extremal uh, shot noise can be ex expressed via the Laplace transform of the additive shot noise. So I in a sense, it's a child of the, uh, of the former shot noise model we had. So you can actually, you can calculate the Laplace transform of the additive shot noise, and the PDF of the extremal shot noise will be expressed as a, fun as a um, you know, it will be express expressed via the Laplace transform of the former shot noise model we have. Okay, they are uh, intricately, you know, they are in, in, in like how to say it, they are really closely related as models, yeah? So when do we need this guy? Uh, this guy is useful when you want to pick some particular and optimal in some <coughs> sense receiver. For example, strongest one, uh, nearest one, uh, the one which provides the, be the best uh, average or uh, correlation, um, metrics, whatever, right? So any, any, any thing that has to do with being better okay in some sense and normally much of it has to do with being uh, when we say strongest nearest best sound statistics in my mind it all boils down to being close in an electromagnetic sense though doesn't need to be close in terms of distance could be that you know you're very close to the transmitter but you are blocked by a, sh uh, a scatterer so but you know you might be closer to another transmitter in terms of electromagnetic right, in terms of line of sight. So when you have situations where you have to pick uh, this thing, uh, the best one, then it makes sense. For example, you could think of it like there is this uh, selection diversity in, uh, in multi-antenna. If you, if you imagine um, a distributed version of that where you have different transmitters, right, transmitting at you and you have to pick the strongest one, this model could model this situation. Or um, user association of any kind, right? When you associate a user to a cell, you should pick the cell that provides the best signal. And again, this model is good for that. Okay? We all good? Yes. Yes. No, I think here, I mean, the, the thing can be... Um, it's everything, okay? So this is like all the, the, the powers you receive. So, you know, you, you can define one of them to be useful, but the model simply tells you the... Uh, right, I, I think that's not correct, in my, in my opinion, this figure. So the basically what you will have here is the total received power. I don't see any reason why, you know, the useful one shouldn't be included here. So I think the figure is a bit imprecise in that sense. Okay, so you here you just say, I have a set of transmitters and I can measure the sum of the powers. Then, of course, you can say label one to be your guy, but th you know that's not just. It's the same thing. I don't see any reason why useful and interferer should be different. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, it's a good observation. So all of this should be I phi tilde. When I prepared the slides, I rehearsed them. I noticed this myself. So you know, it's good you spotted it. Yeah. Okay. Um, now going maybe closing the slot, uh, you know, and going maybe more into details about the specific model we might be interested in. Um, there is actually a, a model uh, which is, uh, is called actually the, um, it's a marked uh, uh, point process, okay? But we are going uh, to be tailoring this model towards uh, a problem we are really interested in, which is a SINR coverage. So we want a certain level of coverage which means a certain level of SINR over our network, right? That's what we normally want. So again, by now we should be, shouldn't be surprised. This is XI are just points of the point process on the plane. 
and they are the antenna locations, right? Um, we can mark this process so we can attach a label to it, right? Uh, with things we are interested in associating to the actual positions. And this would be um, a power, for example, which we already saw before, right? And a threshold. Of course, when you define coverage, you basically talk about outage, and outage is a relative thing. It depends on the level of connectivity you want to provide, right? Of, of signal quality. So you need a threshold. Um, so the cell uh, attached to the point uh, XI will basically uh, be, you know, defined by this process. So where you have uh, phi, okay, and then you have a certain uh, uh, external noise, right? That's the noise we normally model. So um, basically, at a certain position Y, what you have, what you want, is that the power you receive, okay. So SI of i y minus x i, uh, it's uh, you know divided by the noise plus the interference. So here they use basically i phi for all the other guys, right? Uh, and k is some sort of interference cancellation factor depending on the technology. Might be none, might be one, or it might be uh, if you have a perfect interference cancellation, k would be zero, right? Depending on how much you can cancel interference, could be even how much you can coordinate interference between cells, so you know, this is general, okay? Um, and I, we already know, that's uh, basically our path loss, right? It's the attenuation function. So CI, eventually, is the, re the cell or the region where the SINR from XI, which is our intended transmitter, is bigger than a certain threshold TI, which we define as we want. We good? Yeah? Makes sense? Now, just a figure to finish um, how it looks like. Um, now, this is a Boolean model, first of all, right? Because we saw it before. It's exactly a Boolean model, okay? Uh, approximation for, for a SINR. So, uh, now, depending on, the, of course, a key factor, it's uh, the um, interference cancellation capability, right? So, if... Uh, K is actually bigger, it means we are less capable to cancel interference. If K is small, smaller, we are more capable of canceling interference. And here we have constant emitted powers and a certain threshold. Doesn't matter really the values, okay? So if you tend to have, if you go towards a small interference factor, you can actually approximate a SINR by a Boolean model. So um, we start from a model which is not Boolean, okay? It's uh, it's uh, actually uh, basically a shot noise process, right? This uh, I mean you can recognize this is a shot noise process. But what we we see is that if you have actually very good um, interference cancellation capabilities, you can basically use a Boolean model to have a good model for your SINR coverage. Okay, and uh, yeah, so the, there are actually these results showing this. So uh, you can actually approximate your SINR cell by, uh, by cells by a Boolean model. Uh, what are the good things about the Boolean model? It's a simple model, okay? And it allows for closed form expressions, and it does have some attenuation effect account. So in a sense, if you have a better technology or a better scheme to deal with interference, you can actually exploit the benefits of, of a Boolean model to model precisely your, your, your network. Mm -hmm. And no surprise, because the, f the, the main drawback of a Boolean model we saw is ignoring interference. But now it doesn't matter, because interference is not there. You see my point? So there is, in a sense, it's not, you know, again, I, d I want to emphasize, many people think about the model as something completely different, and then somehow you have your reality but it's much more intertwined. The model represents the reality. So if the reality changes, this has an impact on the model, right? You might start from a model, short noise, okay? Uh, but then the reality has changed, okay? Because you are better off in, uh, in interference cancellation, and that will have, again, an impact on the, on the model you can use, correct? So think of it more as a loop, more than, you know, a very compartmental approach to modeling and uh, to model and uh, and the real situation because eventually the model again 
it's a representation of reality, not right or wrong, it's just a representation. It, it suits your purposes, what you want to achieve. And in a sense, there is a loop, right? So, um, you know, there is uh, some interesting also considerations you could do uh, when, when, you know, when we study actually complex systems, uh, because basically what we do, uh, we use, um, in a sense, uh, some scientific tool, okay, to guide the design of our systems. But eventually, uh, especially in communication systems, when you, when you operate the system, you change the reality. You see my point? That's what I said before. The channel is what it is, but you will have an effect on the um, radio environment, right? So if you do beamforming, you, you definitely get rid of a lot of interference. So it is true, let's say the fabric of the electromagnetic environment is the same, but you can impact it quite a lot. And that in return will impact the model you should or could use, okay? So try to be flexible when you use models to represent reality. Yes? These models are applied when you are planning the deployment or because majority of the time the real-time data will come after you have done some initial deployment? Correct. Uh, I so think, you want to yeah. your coverage or yes. Uh, yeah, I am. Um, you are upgrading your system, so. Uh, correct. I, what I kind of models would hold good? Yeah, I, I think, you know, I mean, it looks to me, I'm not, again, I'm not a super expert in stochastic geometry. I've been using it a bit, you know. For basic studies and understanding, I think SPPP does the job, okay? The, the SPPP, though the spatial Poisson point process has problems with clustering, with correlation between uh, different, you know, networks, and so that probably has to be integrated by some other models, like the, the Cox model, for example. Um, there are two kind of studies. You can either see what your network, current network looks like, Right, and maybe take cor corrective actions based on that, or you might use these models to, to see what the network would look like in the future. Like we had this discussion, if you remember, during Professor Da Silva's uh, talk, and uh, you know uh, there was a couple of questions about uh, e whether you could use stochastic geometry to foresee what's going to happen, and you can, yeah. Uh, but you know, it depends on what your your focus is. You, if you have, for example, some indications about the density of users. That would lead, I suppose, to um, um, indications on the SINR coverage level. And then you could see which deployment would work in that sense, right? So you could, you could have a, actually a, a model coming up with, uh, you know, with uh, you can try different deployments and see what's, what's the best. Because here you start from a set of points, okay? So, and, uh, you know, it's, uh, you can, th in the main, this is random, it's a random process, but you can control, for example, the, the intensity, which is the density, right? This lambda thing we saw in the beginning is the number of transmitters per unit of area. So you can try to see change in lambda, what happens, right? You can do that, uh, definitely. Uh, might give some indications. Uh, the good thing about uh, stochastic geometry is that it is, uh, it is uh, an analytical tool. So you d in many situations, it provides nice expressions, which reads you of the need to do a lot of simulations. You can still do simulations when needed and when maybe, you know, the system, like the, the analysis doesn't help or if you need more details and the analysis can't I incorporate them. But it's, it's, a, it's a wiser approach in the sense th than the brute force simulative approach. Okay, you start doing simulations forever and you don't even know what you're doing at some point, right? So I think it can be stochastic geometry or other theoretical models, but it is important to have, you know, some uh, guidance ab uh, about uh, doing simulations, I think, okay? And also for, not so much for cross very fine simulative and analytical uh, results. I think that the main usage of analysis is to tell you, um, first of all, to free you of some need of simulations. Because once you get a closed form expression for that setup, you are done with simulation. You use your formula forever, right? Even if, say, you don't know, you, you can identify areas where you cannot have a closed form expression, it's still useful because it kind of limits the, the space, in a sense, where you have to do simulations, right? You don't do simulations overall, the possible configurations, you just do it for what you, you need, right? So there is, there is a good usage of that. And you can, you can use all of these tools for, to analyze things that are there or to make forecasts about things that um, will be there in the future, right? You, you can definitely do that.
only when you are deployed you can take the data. So, <coughs> yes, I think so it, correct. I think in fact, to my knowledge, mm, a lot of the work has been done studying. Uh, okay, trying to find models that represent the current reality. Okay, rather than, you know, uh, but there are, for example, we also the studies trying to see. You can always push the density, okay? So it's still useful to know, in a sense, even if it's a st st statistic approach and whatever, but you still kind of have an idea, okay, how many nodes would I need? You know, is it like 1,000? Is it a million? Is it 100? So at least in terms of orders of magnitude, I think it can give an idea when you do the plan, right? But you're right. I mean, eventually you, you can, you know, uh, you can be sure about the traffic and so on once the deployment has happened. But you do need to plan. I suppose, you know, operators need to think a bit ahead, right? So they will need some sort. They do have, like, network deployment uh, planning tools, right? They do a software. So they do tweak things. It's, okay, what if uh, I have a massive MIMO here? They do that. I, I know. You know, I saw that. So. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, the, they do that. You need to do that definitely. And, you know, the good thing about these things is like, um, again, for some limited situations and so on, but it gives you an expression. So, it, in a sense, once you know that for that setup, you don't have to do simulations ever again. Right. So, that's, that's the thing. Um, so, it is, and again, let alone, if you're an academic, you need to write journals. Okay. And you cannot write a journal based on a software tool or doesn't work like that. So, you know, there is a bit of professional, right, uh, requirement if you are a scientist, but there are also, like, objective advantages by, by adopting, you know, this sort of approaches and theoretical approaches in general. And, you know, another thing is, like, taste. Some people hate math, and that shouldn't be the case in this room, hopefully, but, uh, you know, if you, if you love math, if you love theory, these are fantastic tools. I mean, you see, I I think it's very nice. I mean, you know, it, 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 it's aesthetically nice, okay? So there is there's a personal taste issue also. So if you have a band uh, towards mathematics, in this sense, uh, try to follow your your instinct and passion, right? It will work. Uh, that's a general, again, like what these random tips I give now and then. You will do good research if you do something you like. You will do very incremental and uh, dull and not satisfactory research if you do something you don't like. I understand the PhDs might be guided somehow, and you have to follow the advisor's, uh, you know, uh, instructions and so on. But try still to, you know, to learn and take up things that you like. Not just the problem can change, but at least you should be very careful how you pick the tools. So try to learn things that you instinctively know will be you will be happy to work with. So uh, if you hate, if you hate uh, the 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 part of the your studies to do with stochastic processes, I would recommend not to do stochastic geometry. But if those kind of things you like, this is going to be fun, right? So again, you have to follow a bit your instinct, I suppose. Any other question or comment? Uh, in the afternoon, I'm going to show a more concrete uh, application of what uh, we, s uh, I mean, at least of the first category of um, of uh, models we saw, so the SPPP. I'm going to show how we did apply to uh, dense networks deployments. And then tomorrow morning, we'll have the Q&A session about uh, 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 how to become uh, a researcher or how to do research, right? Uh, and hopefully, it will be useful. And then tomorrow afternoon, I will start the last part of the course, which is about complex system. And that will go until the end of the, of the course. Um, I discussed with Professor Das, and we will have the second quiz on Monday because the last day.